population I see are typically from about four years old to 18. Um, and I wanted to make these more interesting. Some of the littler ones I've seen, I've only seen for one session, and they didn't show as big of changes over time. So the things I chose were to try to encompass really how I use this approach. To a lot of different kids, many of them are junior pro athletes or athletes from baseball to tennis to basketball to soccer to gymnastics. So um, this happened to be a young man that plays football, 15 years old, and he came to me four months prior, he had had a compression injury in football. So he got tackled from the right and landed on his left, but that person kind of like tackled on top of him. And initially, he really had a lot of left shoulder pain. But that resolved pretty quickly. But what wasn't going away was this right shoulder and side pain. It was into his rib cage, into his upper back, into his shoulder. So he came to me. Um, he had a 4 to 6 out of 10 pain at worst when he would try to go back to throwing or play sports. He was worse at the end of the school day with sitting. He felt better with lying down and sleeping unless he was sleeping on that side and that would kind of aggravate it. So the treatment I did on him in the first day after assessment, and this is not all inclusive of the holy vow because I wanted to get through these with you. But that first day I treated the structures, the coronary ligament, that top of the, the liver as it relates to the diaphragm, the right and left triangular ligaments, the lesser omentum falciform ligament. So a lot of the sensory structures of the liver and the diaphragm in the rib cage are the areas that I focused on. I gave him a home exercise program of ab setting to get his core to get kicked back on, and I'll show an image of that. An isometric chin tuck, which is a stabilization. You can do it supine or prone. This is a sitting where you just lock in and stabilize the neck. And then pec stretches, kind of in the snow angel position with nerve glides to get mobility and to get him opened up through the thoracic. Pre, so he came in with that palm down abduction test at 90 degrees. He had limited rotation of the trunk to the right, some limitation of trunk flexion, his hip range of motion was reduced, his core in that LPM was very weak and non-existent, like he just had nothing, he buckled. He had extension slump tension test at 45 degrees on both. His shoulder strength for both shoulders, that test I did on her were three plus, and this is like an athletic 15 year old, and his cervical range of motion was limited to 40 and 50 degrees. So after those techniques applied, he, came, he cleared. His shoulder palm down abduction was full. His rotation improved in both directions and trunk flexion became full. His hip range of motion nearly normalized. His core was starting to kick in better. He had less neural tension in his lower body and his shoulders kicked into a 5 out of 5. And that was after getting his core and his cervical spine stabilized. So those are prolonged holds to use the radiation to get things kicking in, so PNF principles. And his cervical range of motion improved. So he came back for a second visit a month later. Okay, so I see him a month later. Things had slid backwards a little bit. So his shoulder tightened back up. He kept some of his hip range of motion. His core was kicking in a little bit better. His dural tension test was still a little bit better. His shoulder strength was better but not perfect yet, and it kept some of his cervical range of motion. So again, the treatment was very similar to the first. I treated a lot of the same structures, but I started adding some functional movement into rotation that linked into that hepatic flexor. So it linked into the colon's relationship to the diaphragm, and I added more breath work. I reviewed his home exercise program and stressed the importance of his home exercise program because he came in and he said, I'm not doing my home exercise program. So non-compliance. Okay. Well, this stuff works as long as you get them to integrate and use your system properly. If you don't, things don't hold as well. So I saw, so after treatment, again he improved. His shoulder had a little bit of lacking still at the very top, but things became much more symmetrical and much improved. I forgot to measure cervical extension range of motion at the end. We all do that sometimes, right? But after his third visit, a month later, he came in and he said, okay. I'm doing your program, and I'm back in the gym, and I'm lifting weights now, and I'm feeling better. He actually kept significant change in his shoulder range of motion now with that palm down abduction test. His hip range of motion was better. His core strength was tremendously better, which was really nice to see. His dural tension step test was better, but he still had some on the right more than the left. And his shoulder strength on the left was five. It was good. And that right still had that little bit of a buckle and that little bit of compensation. 
and he kept better improvement in his range of motion than that. After that treatment, he nearly cleared on the shoulder test. His hip range of motion improved. His core strength improved even more. His neural tension improved. His shoulder strength improved. And his cervical range of motion improved tremendously. And I talked to mom several weeks later, and she said, no, he's feeling great. He's back to playing football. He doesn't want to come back again. He's good. And that's where we're at. So what I really liked about this one was that, and I put it in here, is that showing when someone's not compliant with doing some of their stuff to keep some of their stability, they don't do as well as when they actually do their stuff, that they come in with better improvements. So I like the idea that this visceral manipulation can improve things, but they still have to work on breath work, core stability, mobility, neural mobility, all those other pieces. So this is an example, not on him, on my dear friend's little boy. They were saying still letting me take pictures of them. Um, of working into the left triangular ligament and linking it to the rib cage and intercostals and diaphragm. And here we're getting up to the hepatic or the um, coronary ligament and the falciform ligament and lifting the liver up to take tension off the diaphragm so that you can start to get that tissue to slide and glide. And adding functional movement into rotation so that when he goes back to throw that football, he doesn't have that limitation in his viscera. And this is that ab set, and I show it. I call it the cannonball because nobody remembers if you call it the ab set. What you're doing is, is you're pushing your knees into your hands, you're lifting your tail, your heels stay close to your bum, your toes are up, fingers are up. So it's a mass flexion for rolling. But if you hold it for a prolonged period, and this is developed through the Institute of Physical Art, and I think he got it from Dr. Cabot and the PNF stuff, is they found that this uses, so the, I have people hold 30 to 60 seconds or more, the radiation starts to happen, and their system really starts to click and connect, and it improves their core stability. The second case was a 17-year-old female. She came in with cervical, thoracic, and lumbar pain. She had a history of scoliosis. So currently, her last x-ray was at 18 and 20 degrees. At her worst, she was at 26 degrees. She's gluten intolerant and had GI issues from the time she was 10 years old. She's a lacrosse player an athlete. She came in with pain that varied from a 1 to a 4 out of 10. That was worse when she would play sports or carried her backpack or sitting at the end of the day. Um, she also noted that her symptoms were worse during her menstrual cycle. She felt better with rest. She was seeing a chiropractic, inter chiropractor intermittently in massage, and she had this habit of self-cracking everything all the time. I mean, even in the office, it was <laughs> all the time. So what I did was assessed her, and it took me into tensions into the abdomen. We worked into the lesser omentum. We worked into the gap, uh, uh, retro mental pouch, so behind the stomach into the peritoneal layers, the greater omentum as that sheath folds down. Interesting note on the greater omentum, it can move. So I've talked to many different surgeons, and they'll find the greater omentum up over here and wrapped around the liver because the liver had an abscess on it or pulled up or somewhere else. So the greater momentum doesn't always hang. They believe it has something to do with some protective mechanisms in terms of walling off problems. So her greater momentum had significant restrictions in it, the peritoneal sheath, the mesenteric root of the jejunal ileum, so that deep peritoneal layer in head tension, parietal sequel ligaments. So if you remember that image that I showed with the appendix and those ligaments that anchor into the iliac fossa there, all of that was pretty adhered down on her. So, worked to free those up, did PNF into her hip mobility. I educated her on some anatomy because she was really interested and then talked about posture and how to carry the backpack so she wasn't constantly letting herself get crunched down. And I taught her that ab setting for core stability, bottoms up for hamstring and neural mobility, which I'll show a picture of in another slide. So she came in, her pretest, 130 on the right, shoulder abduction. Right side is symptomology more than left for her. Her trunk flexion, this is a tall, lanky, skinny, athletic girl. She just barely went past her knees. That was it. And she said, I've been that way most of my life. I can't bend over. Pelvic shear to the right, so disassociation of the thorax and pelvis, much better to the right than to the left. Hip range of motion was pretty good, but asymmetric. Almost no core initiation. <coughs> she had flexion slump tension and extension slump tension. 
Her psoas strength, so manual muscle testing of her psoas, she had weakness in both. The left was weaker than the right. Cervical rotation was asymmetric and limited. And she had neural tension, so I measure radian nerve tension test and weight abduction is what I'm measuring here for midline. So her right was at 10 degrees and left at 5 degrees. Post-treatment to those structures, much more symmetry. She bent forward 90%. So that idea, remember I said if the intestines and the loops and things can't move, you can't fold. So she had an inability to fold. Her pelvic shear became more symmetrical. Her hip range of motion improved to symmetrical. Um, her core was initiating much better. Her flexion slump cleared. And her extension slump improved quite a bit. Her psoas became much stronger and more symmetric. And the psoas test, if we have time at the end, I'll demonstrate it. It's much like the manual muscle test of the shoulder external rotators, but related to the pelvis. Her cervical range of motion improved almost 10 degrees in both directions, and her neural tension improved. Second visit, she said she was feeling much better until she had a chiropractic adjustment. And now she feels like she has to crack herself all the time again. So something happened to her system in that, that her body didn't like as much. Okay, and she said she felt more sore. So the same, almost identical treatment as the first, but I had to add more into the sigmoid mesocolon. So she had a lot more deeper structures, sigmoid mesocolon, fascia tulsa, that back wall, and her coccyx was off. So I had to do a joint mode. I had to correct her coccyx rotation and deviation. I don't know how that happened, but that was present there. And we added neural glides so that it was freeing up to the nervous system. P and F neural re -ed, and reviewed her home exercise programs and added a wall press that I have a picture of next that links that upper and lower body for core stability in movement patterns. It really relates to that LPM diagonal. She came in, she had kept a lot of her motion, she just was feeling bad again. Um, and her, uh, what was, yeah, I mean most things, her dural tension test had, had gotten a little tighter, but she really still, objective measures was better than the first day. But after treatment, I mean such huge improvement. Everything was nearly good. She went to full flexion, hip range of motion is symmetrical, core kicking in better, neural tension in that extension bias almost to zero, cervical range of motion much more symmetrical. So this was awesome. So she comes back the following month, because I see people once a month, and this is that wall press that I was talking about. So this is an extension PNF pattern, this is a flexion PNF pattern, so you're coming into that midline. You're really firing the glute on the extension pattern and the hip flexion and core on the flexion pattern, and you're pressing into a wall. And it's, again, held 30, 60, 90 seconds. And this, when I, if I can reflect back to myself and I said I got back to running, I do this every time before I run because I feel so much more stable. And even if you don't have any pain, if you're a runner, do this on each side for 60 seconds before you run. And I can tell you I have probably about 10 runners now that I have do it, the ace friends, and it improves their pace because you are connected. Your system's integrating and using the forces better. But when she came back for her third visit, she came back because she wanted to get checked out before she went off to college. And I said, okay, well, let's take a look at her. She said she was feeling much better, no pain, even with prolonged sitting and standing. She just wanted to kind of make sure before she went away because this is her first time going away to college. So I looked at her, and there was just a little bit in the parietal cecal on that right cecum. So she had a little bit of tension into the diaphragm and the liver area. And I had to do a little bit of a, a muscle energy technique because her pelvis had a little bit of a rotation. I don't know if she has a habit of crossing one leg and sitting that way all the time or what was driving that. And we did a little bit of neural glides and some PNF re-education again. But what I loved and why I put this in here is this is someone who has scoliosis too, but the beautiful symmetry that can happen in her body, the scoliosis didn't go away. She still had a rib, rib hump and some asymmetry there. But how her body was allowed to move, she was compliant with her home exercise program. And she came in almost as good as she left last time. Her shoulder was a little tight. There was a little tension there and a little bit of neural tension. But again, after treatment, things became fairly symmetrical and cleared. And she went off to college and was doing great. So this is an example of working into those parietal cecal ligaments, and this is an example of getting into the mesenteric root of the jejunal ilium. Okay, these are gently applied forces. You're sinking into the appropriate structure and depth, but very slowly, so that you get there without discomfort. And the third case, so this is my 10-year-old, and he came to me um, 
his mom had heard about me and knew who I was. So all the patients that I get have word of mouth referrals, and I'd love to treat more little ones. Um, and now that I've seen a lot of grandparents and parents, and now I'm starting to get kids and get littler ones, it's kind of fun because I treat all ages and all populations. But this one was, he'd had a hernia repair at two years old for an undescended testicle. And so he never crawled correctly. He crawled with that leg out at this funny angle and would like kind of side drag himself. And they never knew why. And so he also happened to have pneumonia when he was two years old. And that was his major significant history. He was coming in because he had low back pain, rib pain, and left shoulder pain for three years. Three years of pain that was from a two to a six out of ten. And this little ten-year-old carrying his backpack was miserable. At the end of the school day, he was miserable, and he wanted to do more sports. And mom would massage him, and that would help. If he would rest, or mom would massage him. So the first treatment, I had to work along the abdominal fascia of the obliques. And if you remember that slide with the ilioinguinal, genital femoral, and iliohypogastric nerves coming through there, I had to work along those nerve courses as it related all the way down to the inguinal ligament and influenced the inguinal canal where they traversed through and where he'd had that hernia repair and what had happened into that area and the adhesions that were still present affecting him. I taught him that ab setting and we did some nerve glide and breath work. So this is a 10 year old that came in with, on his right, 85 degrees and 40 on the left. So his little nervous system was locked down. Rotation of his trunk, 10%. His body wouldn't let him move. Flexion, 80%. Hip range of motion, 24 and 20 degrees. They should be like rubber, right? Almost no core initiation on the right and a little bit on the left. Positive flexion slump. And then his extension slump, I could barely get his legs away from 90. His system was so locked down. He had very weak psoas, and his, every time I'd load his leg, his whole core would buckle. And he had limited cervical range of motion. So these were the most significant findings. So again, I treated along those structures in through here and how this may be creating potential tension into his system on that left side. This is working along the rectus sheath and into the obliques and trying to free up those layers as they influence rotation. And you can add lower trunk rotation. You can add heel slides. You can add functional movements to these treatment techniques so that they free things up and breath work. And really looking at, as it comes into that inguinal canal, those three nerves run in the inguinal canal with the spermatic cord and the internal oblique muscle. So every time he would try to rotate, his system would just lock down and protect. So visit number two, he was feeling, oh, I didn't say what, yeah, I said what I said. Visit number two, he was feeling much better. And then what do kids do? They fall. <laughs> he went roller skating and fell, and now he was coming back, not because of that so much, but because his neck hurt. He still had a little bit of stuff on the left side, but his neck hurt. So going into his system, I still had to work a little bit down this left side, a little more into the peritoneum and the greater omentum and the sigmoid mesocolon, so deeper layers, as they related into that inguinal canal and ligament. And then I had to work into the diaphragm and ligament of trites because he gave himself this little bit of a whiplash when he hit his head roller skating. I added breath work, and I still had to work his nerve roots of C4 through 7 as it relates to the brachial plexus with nerve glides because from that he had created tension in that upper quadrant on that side. I gave him the ab set and the bottoms up for homework and that wall press because he wanted to get back to sports. I think he was doing karate and he wanted to play basketball, I think. And so he came in that time with 90 degrees and 105, so still better even though we had a trauma and fall. His trunk flexion was a little limited. His hip range of motion was still better. His dural slump was still better. His core, or his um, psoas strength was better. His cervical range of motion was limited to the right as compared to the left. And his shoulder strength, he had a little bit of weakness. So I chose to test those because he had this trauma to his neck. After treatment, he finally was clear. Like finally, his nervous system was letting him move. Trunk flexion was 90%. Hip range of motion, huge. That day one, he had 24 and 20. 
huge changes. Jarrell Slump tent, he had 85, remember that day one? Now he's at minus 15. His psoas was kicking in better, his cervical range of motion improved, it was asymmetric still slightly, but much improved, and his shoulder strength had improved. And this is the bottoms up exercise for neuromobility. So it's a functional hamstring stretch, a dynamic hamstring stretch that's really targeted at improving mobility of the sciatic nerve as it relates to the dura. So you're in this bottoms up position, tipping up, letting the head relax and coming back down in and out of it. So time for questions and answers. And I put my contact information up here because if you have an interest in this kind of coursework, you want to take visceral manipulation classes, you want to know more about the Baral Institute, I brought flyers if you want them. You don't have to have them. You can email me questions. Um, I did talk to the Baral Institute because I needed permission to release some of the, the information today that I shared with you and some of the anatomy slides that were from them. Um, and they said that if you're truly interested in this coursework, if you email me, I can get you in touch with the guy there that will give an additional discount for your first VM1 class. Um, so that was really nice. I do know VM1 or Visceral Manipulation 1 is coming to Arizona three times in the next two years. Once to Phoenix, once to Sedona, and once to Tucson. Peter Coppola is teaching those classes and he is a phenomenal, he's a PT, and he does a really great job of teaching this in a very um, organized manner. But, so if you have questions on that, let me know. Questions on the case studies or you want to see that SOAS test, I can demonstrate that now. But I do want to say thank you so much for, for listening to everything that I have to share with you, being open-minded, and hopefully I've inspired you to look at things a different way and consider integrating other approaches into what you're currently doing. So opening, yes? 